All right, welcome everybody. My name is Sam Renault. This is episode three of uh, Sports Lawyers Association's new content series, Sport Shorts. I am very excited to be joined by an old friend, Dave Gardy, who is the, let me see if I can get this right, the Senior Vice President of uh, Policy, Ops, and Compliance. That sounds about right. All right, at the NFL. So Dave, you are a football lifer. You played in college. You were a quarterback at Brown. You were raised by a coach. This has been your world for your entire life. So give me a quick, like 30 seconds spiel on, on your background and your rise through the NFL. Yeah, look, my dad coached uh, 46 years at every level, right? He was uh, with the Jets. He was with Hofstra University. So clearly I wanted to follow in that, uh, in that you know, family business. And I've been around it, even, you know, Jets training camps when I was younger. So there was always that goal to work in the NFL. Thank God I was offered an internship uh, back in law school. And thank God they offered me a job uh, shortly after my you know, legal career started, about seven years at a law firm. And then they brought me back in management council where I had interned. So I uh, made the jump to football operations in 2014 and uh, worked for Troy Vincent and uh, enjoy being close to the game. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you've got such a diverse range of experience. You can kind of shed some light on a lot of the things that the NFL went through this year. And obviously it was uh, for everybody challenging and sports challenging in really unique ways. So let's start off with, you know, normal calendar for you. What is it typically you know, starting in January or I guess starting with the off season? What, walk us through your typical year. Yeah, Sam, I think people would think, you know, working in football operations, once the confetti comes down at the stadium at Super Bowl, you're quiet and everything's quiet for a while. Well, we actually get really busy next week. We start competition committee meetings with all of our rules, proposals, and any changes we would make with uh, league policies and things like that. And that leads up to the annual meeting where things are voted on, um, real busy time for us in football operations. And then obviously we lead into the NFL draft. We do a ton of club visits during the off season to talk about the rule changes and what, what's on the minds of our clubs, which we didn't do last year and more than likely we'll do it virtually this year. And then as we get closer to the start of the season, Sam, it's, um, you know, educating people on our policies. It's um, preparing for the season. It's uh, from a game operations perspective, making sure we got everybody hired and everybody in place to do things. And then uh, once we kick the ball off at a Hall of Fame game, every weekend it's either at a game. I usually travel to two games a week. Uh, usually a nationally broadcast game. And then we have reps out at all the games and uh, we're monitoring, administering a lot of the things with our, our league policies and our game operations manual and uh, just tracking trends and things that go on in the season. And then that bleeds all the way into the regular season, into the postseason, and it culminates with what we just had at Super Bowl. Now, obviously it was, it was unique this year, but a lot of people travel, a lot of people that work with me were on the road constantly or we're in the command center on Sundays for games. And all of that had to change a little bit this year. All right, so let's, this takes us all back to March of 2020. I mean, you, you've just had the combine. Everybody's gearing up for pro days. Your, your personnel folks are getting ready to, to travel to every campus across the country. March 12th hits. What was your expectation for the coming weeks and, and what actually happened? Uh, look, I, I mean, there's so much uncertainty even to this day. So at that point, um, you know, like you said, we just completed the combine. We were preparing for the annual meeting. And while that's going on, our club personnel are going to college campuses or they're bringing in players for pre-draft visits. When we continued on with a free agency period and didn't move that date back, but then we wouldn't allow our scouts to have either go on campus or have players at the facilities, there was certainly concerns from a pre-draft standpoint. Do we have enough information on, our, on those prospects? We had the combine, we had video, our club GMs and personnel folks had video. So I think there was sort of a comfort level that at least we had sort of the medical and, and as much video as possible. Um, and then, you know, there was this sort of anticipation, like what's gonna happen with the draft? Are we gonna push it back and try to do it in person? And when the decision was made not to move it and do it virtually, uh, you know, many of us got phone calls. I don't know if we can do this. And hey, we got through the draft with, again, we didn't know what the next week looked like, next month looked like, or what was going to happen during the season. And I hope folks on, on the Zoom, you know, feel like our 2020 draft really was spectacular and, it, and brought in new concepts that perhaps could be used 2021 and beyond. And um, again, I would say every day, every week and every month, looking forward, we just didn't know what the next turn, what, you know, and the word pivot 
probably has been used by everybody on the Zoom and we had to be prepared to pivot at every step. So I didn't know what to expect from the season, the preseason, whether we were gonna have preseason games, um, whether we were gonna have an off season program and we went virtually. So it was kind of trying to adapt and pivot as they say. Yeah, I, I guess I can probably speak for a lot of people getting to see Commissioner Goodell just lounging in his basement and, and having the fireside chat during the draft was, was a new perspective on him that I think a lot of people appreciated. Yeah, definitely. Um, I also, and we didn't prep on this, but it just sparked my, my thoughts. This rookie of the year race was tighter than any I can remember, which makes me think that this offseason process and evaluation process was as successful as it could have been. Um, and I don't want any Vikings fans coming at me with any kind of hate. There were a lot of really high performing rookies who were who were really well and accurately evaluated. And, I, and that and that Sam, that goes to all the work. I mean, when they're looking at these, you know, sophomores and juniors, and all the work, the inordinate amount of work that goes into the scouting. I mean, clearly they were prepared and I'm sure they will be this year in 2021, even with think about it. We had players that opted out, which we had in the past, but we probably maybe had a few more. And then we had some, you know, my son plays in, you know, uh, FCS. I mean, FCS, some, there's teams, that, there's players that didn't even play this year and perhaps won't play this spring. So our, our, I know our personnel folks at our clubs will do, will do a really good job and uh, kind of look forward to the process this off season. And I think they feel like not having in-person workouts at the combine this year will sort of put a little bit more emphasis on the pro days and different things that are going on might even protect them from overthinking in general. You know, you meet a guy and you might convince yourself to believe you're seeing something on tape that you're not just because you like him. Yeah, that's so, possible. Definitely. This might, might be a positive for everybody. Yeah. So I know, I know you weren't directly involved in this, but there was the NFL and the, the PA had to do some negotiation on the CBA front um, from an outsider's perspective. I mean, that was, a, was it a success to you? What, what can you share on that? Yeah. So if you think about the timing, I mean, the extension of the CBA was done in March of 2020 and, I don't know. I can't think of the days. Maybe maybe it was sort of before the pandemic really hit. Might have been shortly the days after. I'm not. I can't. I can't remember. But um, and then you know the folks in management council, the department I used to work uh, work in. You know they worked tirelessly with folks at the NFL Players Association. And again, the word pivot. Right. Everybody had to pivot and figure out. Okay, um, we're going to negotiate a protocols and all that went into it with a lot of. Um, obviously work in collaboration with medical personnel. And, uh, you know, I give those folks a lot of credit in management council and the PA. They, they worked hard. Um, they used common sense and the protocols evolved. And each time they had to evolve, obviously it was both those sides getting together and trying to make common sense of it and trying to really put obviously the safety of our players and team personnel as a priority. So, um, they deserve so much credit that we got to where we got, you know, completing the Super Bowl. But again, I'm sure through that process, there were, um, you know, uh, a lot of time spent, some, some uh, difficult conversations, but it shows when you can uh, partner together and look what we accomplished, right? No, it was. And, and again, from an outsider's perspective, it seemed like the most collaborative work being done by the PA and the NFL that I've seen, um, at least in my career. What's interesting is I think people forget is that our officials, our game officials ha are unionized. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you start thinking about how we're going to apply protocols to our players and games and training camp and travel and things like that. And then, you know, a group of our staff and football operations had to work tirelessly with the NFL referees association and almost, you know, again, negotiate different aspects of what our game officials are going to do as far as how many times a week they would COVID test and what would happen if somebody tested positive. So a lot of things went, um, went on behind the scenes that people probably don't realize, but uh, a lot of hard work. So from an ops perspective, I mean, your priority, everybody's priority was health and safety. But after that, you all were responsible for maintaining competitive balance within all these decisions you're making. So what's your perspective on that? What kinds of decisions had to be made with that in mind? Yeah, just just examples like, um, you know, when we realized we weren't going to have a preseason, okay, what is that? What has that impact? Things like player development. Um, you know, clearly, if no one was playing preseason games, we realized there wasn't going to be a really competitive advantage for anybody. But you know, one could argue with a veteran team coming back, right, and a, at a, an established head coach, um, those folks coming into the season. So we we looked a little bit at that. But then when we go into the regular season. 
you know, we had to develop a crowd noise policy. I mean, think about decades of NFL football where uh, we we certainly prohibited all, you know artificial crowd noise. Now we had to implement a policy around it and whether there's gonna be some competitive advantages, disadvantages. And it was interesting because then, then you start thinking about, you know, when you go play Seattle and, and different places on the road and you're that road team going in, you know, it's you're game planning for not being able to hear each other at the line of scrimmage. Then all of a sudden you're at a, you're now at 70 decibel artificial crowd noise. And what does that do and impact things? And we had to go administer that policy and monitor it uh, throughout the season. That's just one example of sort of things we had to um, apply. And then we had to start thinking about what if we missed games? What would happen? What would the postseason look like? Um, how would we make up games? And you saw a little bit of the sh shuffling of bye weeks and different things like that throughout the season. Again, always with the medical and health and safety in mind that was driving us to those decisions. So, um, um, you know, just trying to deal with some of those, you know, what ifs, and we dealt with them all season, right? Face it. And I know people on the Zoom right now are in, right in the middle of it with their seasons or preparing for their seasons. And it's, it's, we're still dealing with the what ifs. One of the biggest decisions that I can remember happening um, on your behalf was when California shut everything down and you had to find a new home, or, or I guess it was, it was in Santa Clara, it was shut down. You needed a new home for the Niners. How did you handle that? <laughs> well, you know, look, um, you prepare and we do every year. So again, I'm sure there's there's perhaps some club personnel on this Zoom and we call them uh, before the season starts. We say, hey, we may need you. We may need you to host a neutral site game. And I think, Sam, you know, you can write all the policies down and, you know, I'm still lawyering, lawyering up things and you write all the policies in the game ops manual and you, hey, if we have to implement, this is how it will happen. Well, this all of a sudden became real life and we have stadiums on hold every week. And I called Michael Bidwell and said, look, we may have a, situation here just want to know if you guys are ready and available and to his credit and the Cardinals organization and I think the 49ers would say this it literally it was almost a flip of a switch and I don't want to discredit how much work went into it but that's how seamless it was to say okay 49ers probably won't be able to practice in Santa Clara they definitely won't be able to play games they're literally within days they're on a you know charter down to down to Glendale staying at a hotel and they hosted three games in that stadium. And again, for the for the audience here, the last game of the season was, I believe, San Francisco hosting Seattle in Arizona the day after the um, bowl game at the stadium. So they kicked off on a Saturday night and there's logos all over the field for the bowl game. And we had to try to figure out how to host the 49ers game the next day without those logos, the Fiesta Ball logos, or whatever it was. So again, somehow we figured it all out. Um, all the policies we have on paper that people barely look at until it's necessary, all of a sudden now became real life. And I do a lot of credit to the 49ers, but the Cardinals really came through. And Sam, we learned something through that experience, right? So now when we start going back to our policies, all the things we need to tweak, all the things that may have happened over the course of that 49ers stay there, um, will work out, you know, whether it's business, dealing with business partners from the 49ers that have to apply to a new stadium in, in, you know, in Arizona, all that stuff we learned a lot from and, and we'll tweak our policies over the off season. But that's something, I mean, you had to worry about signage and sponsor conflicts and all of those things. Is that something that, that fell on the teams to work out or did you all take a leadership role in helping them navigate that? It, it is, it was outside my lane. Okay. So, and I know I'd stayed right in my lane and I made sure folks from the 49ers and the Cardinals and the stadium kind of worked that out. So it seemed fine. Um, I don't know how they did it. Um, there was a, some sort of a short lease agreement that the 49ers worked out and all that stuff kind of, um, but again, I think I would go back to like a Hannah Gordon and, and, you know, folks at the Cardinals and say, all right, what, what did you learn? What things popped up through this process that we need to sort of figure out in putting policy going forward? So that all being said, uh, before we get into Super Bowl, you guys implemented a whole lot of different policies. I mean, you had to deal with crowd noise and different laws by state and different COVID protocols by state. What do you think is here to stay, regardless of what happens this offseason? What do you think was a very temporary fix for, for what's going on now? Yeah, the group that dealt with the protocols, and again, 
let's you know let's look look forward and say we move away from things like COVID testing and PPE and social distancing and things like that. And then you start evaluating what we implemented this year, which was we re greatly reduced travel um, parties for teams, the sidelines. And I know I realize there's probably some people that attended games that are on the Zoom. I mean, you look at our sidelines for Super Bowl. We looked down from the control booth upstairs and we were shocked how clean the sidelines were at Super Bowl. So the thought was, OK, maybe we um, we 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 hold true to the things that we implemented this year, things like. Uh, the size of your travel party, the um, access to field, uh, whether it's media or team personnel or, um, you know, folks during the pregame time frame. If you ever have been to a, a game and you see people taking their photos and stuff pregame, is there something we can do to condense that? Um, I would say from a, from a game day perspective, I think um, our team people probably because there were so few people involved and were credentialed, they did more with less. They showed their versatility. So we're going to see, all right, was there anything that we missed this year from a game operations perspective, from a football ops team perspective? Were there things that you couldn't get done on game day because we reduced that, those personnel? And if there wasn't, then maybe we stick with that. And maybe we, we don't have 100 photographers and media personnel and things like that. I think we've got to evaluate that uh, during the off season and obviously work with our business partners, our media partners and things like that. That's one that sticks in my mind. Um, you know, again, I, I don't know what to expect for off season programs and training camp and game day going forward, but that's one from a game day perspective. Um, you know, I see holding true from a, I don't know what the crowds will look like next year. Let's hope for full stadiums in the NFL. If we had to go back to where there's sort of partial fans, I would assume we'd, we'd carry forward our, our crowd noise policy and allow that to happen again. But again, we'll see how that all shakes out. Are you, were you involved at all in the, the logistics of the combine for this year? A little bit. We got a small group of people that are working on, you know, trying to um, just kind of figure out a new format to it, knowing that we didn't want to bring uh, prospects together for workouts and things like that. So it's a work in progress. Um, there were combine invites that were sent out. And we're going to really focus in on the medical side of it to try to get um, the medical information our, our teams need and obviously give the prospects a platform. We're trying to develop out ways uh, for them to engage with the media and things like that, knowing that they wouldn't all be together all at once in one spot. So um, that process continues and it'll probably be a focus over the next week or two. All right, so let's talk Super Bowl. Uh, we just wrapped on that. Um, that was it was quite a game, depending on who you're rooting for. It was probably a great game. <laughs> Um, so what goes into that? What was different about planning this year's Super Bowl that you hadn't had to deal with in the past? Yeah, I mean, look, lay on top of <laughs> all the COVID protocols, right? And when two teams get to that game, right, um, everything has to be buttoned up on their end of it. And look, the Chiefs and the Bucks have been dealing with that since the day they walked in the training camp and daily testing and um, virtual meetings and things like that. So you almost don't want to mess with what they're doing because they've been doing that the entire season. But what's unique for us is we usually have two teams coming into Super Bowl City on Sunday or Monday the week before. And they're in a hotel, they're working out at practice facilities. We really didn't have to do much of that work because think about it, it's the first Super Bowl we had where one of the teams, it was their home stadium. And then Kansas City, um, thought the best approach for them was to stick inside what they know in Kansas City and stick with their protocols and then fly into Tampa on Saturday. So all the pre-work that we do, which takes a ton of people and a ton of time, still had to be done. It just wasn't, we didn't have the two teams um, there that we had to really take care of for the week. And again, it was limiting personnel in and around the stadium, uh, making sure that folks were physically distant uh, if you, if you, you couldn't tell if you watched the broadcast, but there was, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but the, the media, they were sort of in that operational zone around the first, you know, level first seating area in the, in the lower bowl, but on the field itself, it was unbelievable how few people were down in that field. So, um, again, not having a, a media night where there's a bunch of media, um, folks, uh, descending on one location. We had the virtual stuff. And I think, you know, people improvised. And, and Sam, I don't know if you saw NFL honors. I mean, 
we all kind of improvised and, and it kind of all worked out. And um, uh, for us in football operations, I sit next to Troy Vincent and Don Aponte in the control booth. And for us, it's when you see the confetti fall and you know you just got through it. Um, we were exhausted more so than we were in any other year, but it was gratifying. It really was to get through it. That's great. And I wonder how much of this is that people just wanted a game and didn't really care much about any of the little details. They just wanted to be there and, and make it successful. So they were willing to sort of ignore things they didn't love. And we'll see if that, that holds true for next year. Even the halftime show, Sam, it was up in a part <laughs> portion of the stadium which you would never do, right? Because you're not going to kill seats to have a halftime show stage. But we did it, and the weekend, and the dancers came down on the field. And um, I hope it was a good halftime show for everybody. I know I enjoyed it. And again, all these things, the behind the scenes look, um, if they ever did a documentary to see what goes into putting on the Super Bowl, including, like, I know we're on a Sports Lawyers Association, the number of attorneys involved and all the things that, that have to go into this. Um, it is truly remarkable um, how we put this thing on and how much time it takes, years in preparation. Yes, this will be the last thing we talk about, then we'll wrap here. But um, I know you're not allowed to talk about specifically who's on the competition committee, but what, who makes that up? Like what type of people are on there? And then what's next for you guys as you start planning for next year? Yes, so the competition committee uh, is made up of owners, GMs. Uh, we have three head coaches on the competition committee. It's, it's actually Mike Tomlin, Sean Payton, and Ron Rivera. And the conversation, uh, we talk about playing rule proposals. If there was something that was particularly troubling that happened over the last season or seasons, and we needed a rule change, um, even for player health and safety reasons. Let's say we, we our data shows us that uh, we have a in, you know sort of an uptick in injuries in a certain area. So we made changes to the kickoff rule, if you remember a couple of years ago. So all those things get discussed. Um, Things like scheduling of games and potentially competitive issues with the scheduling of games. Now, you know, we could potentially go to another regular season game if we expand the season, right? So what goes into all that? Um, game operations policies, uh, you know, anything that has to do with um, scouting and anti-tampering policy and all that thing. They all get vetted out by the competition committee. And we have some members, our chairman, Rich McKay, has been... I think the chairman for over 20 years. So you have some people that have been around for a long time who know the history of things and know where we were and where we got to uh, certain rules and policies. And then it kind of culminates in the ownership meeting, usually at the end of March where things are voted on. Um, I don't know what to predict this year. I don't think there's going to be, you know, massive rule changes, but, um, you know, a team has all the you know, it has the ability to bring up a rule proposal. The competition committee can bring up one. So we'll see what comes about over the next uh, couple of weeks. But, uh, you know, we've been working a little bit with the competition committee over the course of the season. And then we were able to have an, uh, a group of an in-season competition committee who helped us navigate a little bit that are not affiliated with teams, uh, you know, some former members of the competition committee. And they helped us sort of come up with, we had a policy in place ready to go in case we didn't finish the season and we needed to come up with a postseason format. So they were very helpful in that, in that sense. But I'm looking uh, next, forward to that process. Usually a fun time of year. Yeah, that's great. Uh, next owners meetings, all this stuff gonna be virtual this year? Is that known yet? Yeah, I don't, I think there's probably, I believe there, a memo went out about virtual meetings. I'm assuming in the near term, they will be. Um, but I, you know, again, I've traveled to games Sam, I was able to be there for the opening of mm -hmm. SoFi in LA and then Allegiant in Las Vegas. So I've, I've traveled a little bit. I've seen some people in person, but think about, you know, we have some folks that haven't seen each other in, in a long time. So I think gathering uh, when we can do it safely is going to be appreciated, definitely. That's great. Well, I know you've had a long season. I really appreciate you joining me for tonight. Very little rest after the Super Bowl. So thank you um, to everybody who, who tuned in. We appreciate you. Um, this is Dave Gardy with the NFL, and we will hopefully see everybody again in two weeks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, everybody.